Stay right there in your cuisine chair For 30 minutes of pleasure Don't you go, it's more than the show It's the talk of the desert It's the talk of the desert with Belinda Reed I just love coming home at night I turn around, she's a treasure Now, here's Melinda. Talk of the Desert's on location at New York Country Club for Birth Choice of the Desert's benefit for the 2001 season. And we are celebrating the Choice for Life dinner. And I have to tell you that my special guest, my very special guest, when I told my brother George that I was going to be interviewing this person, he was very impressed. And my brother's sort of hard to impress. Well, I'm impressed that I am interviewing this person, and I guess I have to call him the Rhinestone Cowboy. Does that give it away? <laughs> Glenn Campbell. Glenn, welcome to Talk of the Desert. Oh, thanks. I'm so thrilled that you could take your time to do this. Well, thank you, Melinda. I'm, I'm glad you're doing it, because <laughs> I think it's a great cause, and I, uh, my wife and I support this in Phoenix. That's wonderful. It's a crisis pregnancy center crisis here in, pregnancy the, center, in the desert. It's a mm -hmm. pro-life organization, mm -hmm. and I just think it's marvelous that you're here to play for the benefit. Oh, I think it is, too. I think it's here because I hear all the people coming in. I think it's great, you know, because this is, this is, looks like it's going to be a good one. Man, is this, is this tie and tails? Because I run off without my... I don't think it said anything about... Well, I'm on the stage. I can, I can wear anything. Right? You this can. is my show outfit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. As the star, you can wear anything that you want to. <laughs> Glenn, I always ask my guests, where were you born and where did you grow up? Uh, well, I, I was uh, born in Arkansas, and I'm almost grown up. Uh, <laughs> Just like my daddy. I, I, figured, I figured one of these days, my dad always said, son, what are you going to be if you grow up? And that's, that, I now know what he meant by it. You're still a kid at heart, but you can't do what you could do when you was a kid, you know. I was out there hitting balls today, and he hit four or five balls, and I said, wow, you know, that's tiresome. I'm going to go back and watch TV. <laughs> but you were, you were born in Delight, Arkansas. Mm -hmm. Right. What part of the state is that in? It's, a, it's southern. It's four miles south of the diamond mine, which is the only diamond mine in North America. And there have been diamonds found there. And, uh, of course, there have been some jewels that have come out of that country. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's south, south central. Glenn, I understand you came from a huge family. Yeah, there was 12, 12 kids, eight boys and four girls. Boy, did you have to fight to get meat or food on the table? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mama said dinner's ready. You went there and got it. <laughs> <laughs> that is pretty amazing. How did you get started playing the guitar? It was something that uh, the daddy did, that uh, the family did, my older brother. They would they'd play the guitar a little bit and sing. And I played the mandolin. My first instrument was mandolin because it was, so, it was little, you know. And I learned three or four chords on it, but I didn't, I, I liked the guitar a lot better. When, when Dad bought us a, a, a pretty, actually pretty nice guitar. I think it was $8 from Sergeant Roebuck. But it's sure <laughs> a lot better than what we had. <laughs> and uh, that, that started me out. And he's, I'd actually, I remember from being, you know, like two, three, four years old, you know, of, of sitting on Daddy's knees singing, you know, Silver Hair Daddy of Mine. And uh, oh my gracious, I just, uh, Fabulous songs, you know, the old songs. I still remember that. You Are My Sunshine. Oh, that was one of my favorites. Yeah, I remember those. I can do that in a concert now, and everybody sings along. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. But it was, uh, that started it out. It, that was a whole lot easier when I made a little bit of money uh, playing at an ice cream parlor after school in Delight. Uh, I figured that's the easier way to make money than picking cotton or farming or insulation or doing anything like that. And you like the samples that came with it in an ice cream parlor, right? Yes, I did, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Bugs' is ice cream parlor, I'll never forget that. I go by there now in D-Light and there, it's like a little ghost town, you know. Hard to go home, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's yeah. hard to go back. Now, did your parents give the rest of the, your siblings musical instruments to play? Oh, yeah. They all played and sang, but they, they wanted to make... Uh, the, the money, the quick buck, and that was insulation at the time. Uh, and, and as soon as they got old enough, boy, bingo, they were off to Houston, Texas doing insulation work. I had to lay the last crop by when I was about 13 and a half years old. And that's, you know, plowing the corn, doing the center roads, stuff like that. And the crop, we had probably 25 acres of uh, corn. Mm -hmm. Well, but I also read in your bio that you decided to take off and started playing at the age of 14. Mm -hmm. That's 
pretty young. <laughs> yeah, it is. Well, I talked mom and dad and let me go to New Mexico with Mr. Board Hardy because he had a great guitar. He had one of those Gibsons, an old Gibson, and it was wonderful. And uh, I actually got to go down and, uh, and we played at a place, got to play with a guy called Texas Slim. We played at a place called Coon Holler in Lenders, New Mexico. But to make a long story short, that, ooh, it just exploded, you know. Then I went to Wyoming with my Uncle Boo for three weeks. We starved. It was cold. But uh, my uncle heard me play. That uh, was married to my dad's sister, and he, he hired me to play five days a week on the radio show in Albuquerque. And we played like four or five nights a week in the clubs and in rodeo dances, stuff like that. Uh, FFA halls, uh, the, the Elks, the Mooses, those kind of club dances we did. Mm -hmm. Well, Glenn, did you, when you picked up the guitar, were you just, oh, did you already play the mandolin? So, we, did you just were a, really adapted to the guitar easily? Because you are a superb guitarist. I did, and uh, Dad brought me a capo because the strings were real high on it. That paid off later because uh, uh, when I started doing studio work, uh, you know, I could play open ringing chords in any key. It didn't matter if it was A flat, B flat, or whatever. Slap that capo on, boy, I could play open chords. <laughs> and that's what got me all my sessions. I got to play on. Uh, when Bobby Darren heard it, he, was, he had a guy that, that, that used a capo, but he used it for finger picking. I use mine just strictly for open ring and chords, like on, on You've Lost That Love and Feeling. I mean, uh, it's on Strangers in the Night in C position, and the song was an F. You know, -da 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 -da. Uh, all the old Ronnie the Ronette stuff. The Phil Spector sound is really what got me into doing the studio work with just playing the open ring and rhythm guitar. Fascinating. Yeah, it is. No, He's I, my baby. I, I just got to ask you about your uncle, though. How did you, your uncle was on a radio station in Albuquerque, New yeah, Mexico? Yeah, we, we had a five-day-a-week five radio show called the Noonday Roundup. The uh, Fair and Young show came through, and a special guest was Elvis Presley. And uh, Yes, and he had made the mistake of, of uh, putting Elvis on first in Amarillo two nights before. <laughs> And he said, he said, them people are crazy now, Amarillo. He said, I'm about to go on, hello, wall. And they said, we want Elvis, we want Elvis. And he was smart in Albuquerque and the rest of the tour. He went up, Farron Young went up and did what Farron Young does. And then he introduced his special guest, Elvis Presley. And, it, and I got to see him live with the three guys. And it was the most astounding thing I'd ever seen in my life. I can understand why Elvis Presley sold more records than any other male singer. Hmm. Then you did come to Los Angeles at a fairly young age also. Yeah, I did. Yeah. I, got to, I got to play with Elvis on the Viva Las Vegas soundtrack. Because I'd met him in Albuquerque. Right. You know. What are you doing out here in California? Boy? <laughs> <laughs> I said the same thing you are. Only I'm on the rhythm guitar end of it. <laughs> but I, you, you were in the studio um, uh, orchestras, or studio yeah. backups, for mm -hmm. several people during, uh, uh, what, about five years or so? Uh, yeah, I, it was in, I was in there doing demos and whatnot from like 61. I did the, my last session, singing session with, Mer, with Merle Haggard. I sang on Carolyn with him, and that was 1970. People would still ask me to come and sing harmony on their records. <laughs> I still went in and did some Beach Boy stuff after that. I did Good Vibrations with them and that album. And I was a Beach Boy for a while. It was, it was great. I, I, I think uh, God has just let me do some of the most interesting things, you know. I, I, I'm really surprised. I look back on it and I say, just thank you, Lord. It's, that's, it's truly amazing who I got to play with and work Absolutely. with. I totally agree with you. Um, but how did you get into playing be the backup for several of these big stars? Because, I mean, so you just, most people go to Los Angeles and they go to like Capitol Records and they just don't get hired immediately. Right. I did demo sessions. Uh, Jimmy Bowen and I, who was a, he run a reprise for Sinatra. In fact, he did Strangers in the Night with Sinatra. He's a great producer and he's a dear friend of mine. He lives in Phoenix now also, so we play golf all the time. Not all the time when we can. But uh, he and I did uh, demo sessions for a publishing company. And they, played us ten, they paid us $10 a song. Well, we'd go down in one day and knock off six, seven songs in three hours, you know. We'd overdub everything. Ping pong with the track, ping pong with the track, because all we had was one track to record with. We'd put, the, we'd put the guitar on, doodle 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 doodle, and then put, put something else on it and ping pong in. By the time you got through with it, you were down to probably five, six generations. But I didn't care. I mean, it sounded good. We got some, we got some records cut. Then the arranger said, who's playing guitar on this, on, this, on this demo? And he said, Glenn Campbell. Who's singing on it? Glenn Campbell. Who's doing the oohs and ahs? Glenn Campbell. So that's how I got into doing studio work. The, the, the arrangers that did the big records, uh, started calling Glenn Campbell to play guitar, or asking their guys who booked the musicians to, hey, get Campbell, you know, he, he can play a good open ring and guitar. Well, we're looking at concentrating on the guitar aspect, but when did you discover that you had a great singing voice? Oh, a long time ago. When I was 
ever since I could talk. I was just a great singing voice, but I've, been, <laughs> but I've been singing ever since I could talk, yeah. You know, you are my sunshine, my only sunshine, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but so it's you, uh, you just kind of went with playing guitar. And we'd I went with what I could make the most money at then, and that was playing guitar and doing sessions. Mm -hmm. And I, I did all the Merle Haggard stuff, played rhythm guitar, and I'd sing harmony with him. I can still sing all the harmony parts to, to, to the Merle Haggard stuff, yeah. Oh, let's see. Now, here's the harmony part, too. Down every road, there's always one more city. Now, that's the harmony part. You know. mm -hmm. I, from, from doing it so much, I learned to train my ear to sing any part. It was just really, that's what I thought, when I got to sing with the Beach Boys, I could just jump all over the place, because anything I did fit. Brian Wilson was a total genius when it came to, to voicing voices and making them sound good, you know. But how did, so how did the part come about that you got to um, substitute for some of the Beach Boys? Uh, Brian wasn't going on the road, so they called me and said, because I'd sung with them on a couple of, I'd, I'd played on their sessions mm -hmm. from literally the beginning, and I'd sang with them on one thing called, uh, I want to dance, dance like I'm done. And uh, they called me and I said, you play bass? I said, for that kind of money I can play bass. <laughs> 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 and it was, boy, I tell you, $400 a day in expenses. I can play bass, and that was the, what, 1964. Ooh, $400 a day was what looked the biggest of a wagon wheel, as Daddy said. <laughs> so, Glenn, when did you um, decide that you'd set out on your own and try to record something by yourself? Well, that's 1962. I did turn around and look at me. It was, a, it was a mild hit for me. But I couldn't go out on the road or play clubs and make as much money as I could play doing studio work. That's why I never went out on the road. I had, by the time I'd get to Phoenix, I was still doing studio work. Gentleman of mine, I was still doing studio work. I'd, I'd go out and play a little, but then you gotta hire a man, you know. Hey, we'll give you 1500 to come to Phoenix and play so-and-so and so-and-so. Well, we'd get four musicians and drive to Phoenix or fly to Phoenix or whatever, and you got no money left. I could make $1,500 a day in a studio. And so that's why I didn't, that's why I didn't do it. But uh, I think as, as uh, God would have it, when Tommy Smothers put me on the Summer Brothers Smothers show, mm -hmm. I had a gentleman of mine, by the time we get to Phoenix, uh, Hey Little One, Burning Bridges, uh, and which Saul Lyman was almost finished. And he put me on national TV, so I had the product to sell. Mm -hmm. And that's why there was such a burst of uh, mm -hmm. capital. They, they printed everything up. You know, and, and I outsold anybody in the world in 19, 1969 simply because I had the product. I had like five different albums. You had the product and you had the promotion behind the TV exactly. show. Exactly, right? I had yes. the record company behind me. That's the main thing. If you've got the record company behind you, you can do it. One thing, I want to compliment a former guest on Talk of the Desert, Buck Stableman, married to Beryl Davis. Mm -hmm. He was with Capitol Records when you signed with Capitol Records. Mm -hmm. And he says that you were just an absolute dream to work with because you'd play golf with the DJs that would play your music. Exactly. <laughs> hey, boy, you go on a promotional tour, I said, do you got anybody out there that plays golf? I'll, 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 go, I'll go to those stations. <laughs> well, obviously it worked. It worked, it really did. It's been, a, it's been such an interesting life. Very really much so. Happened. Well, okay, you, you, most people don't just, okay, you, you, were doing, you did some recordings, you're obviously a fabulous singer, and you did very well in your record sales, and then you got the TV show. I mean, did, did somebody just come knock on your door and say, hey, Glenn, uh, we, we want you on television, or? Well, Tommy's mother saw me on the Joy Bishop show with he and Regis Philbin, and uh, I did Gentleman of Mine, and by the time I get to Phoenix, on the show, and, and I, had, I had done a couple of albums with Tommy and Dickie, playing at the open ringing guitar sound, you know. And Tommy says, I didn't know you sang like that. He said, can you talk? I said, I'm talking to you. <laughs> he said, can you read cue cards? I said, if you ain't got two big of words in them. And I was putting him on. The, and he laughed. He, and so he said, I went down and tried out. And he had the whole idea about me sitting there, hi, I'm Lynn Campbell. This is blah, blah. And I had to say it so loud because people were applauding. I, started, I said, I want to go back and overdub that. I mean, you know, hi, I'm Glenn Campbell. Welcome to the show. It, it was not Campbell. Hi, I'm Glenn Campbell. It was just so high because you, I was in the middle of 250 people that were applauding, going and whistling and hollering. But, and it was Mason Williams. I got to give him credit. He was head writer on the show, and he was just marvelous. He knew there were certain things I didn't want to, in certain areas I didn't want to get into. I didn't want to get into politics. I didn't want to get into anything except good fun, good entertainment, and singing and playing. And let them do the sketches, you know. Uh, Steve Martin was a writer, Rob Reiner was a writer on the show, Stiller and Mira were writing on the show, John Hartford, yeah. It was, there was a lot of people. Alan Thicke wrote on the show, too. 
Mm. Mason Williams was the, was the glue that put it all together, though, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, that show lasted for about, what, three and a half years? Three and a half years. Mm -hmm. But I also read someplace that somebody gave you a big compliment that you have seemed to have a sixth sense about um, being able to select a song that will become, at least for your style, a major hit. Do you know about that sixth sense? Uh, <laughs> I, I, I have to like it. I, I, what I really like is a good melody and a good chord progression. That's like Galveston just totally blew me away. And, I, and Don Ho gave me the record when he did my TV show. He says, he said, you, maybe you can have some luck with this. And he handed me a 45 of Galveston. But he had done it as a ballad. And when I heard it, I went, oh boy. Galveston, no. Oh but when I heard it, I wrote the lyrics out. And when I read the lyrics, it just exploded. Mm -hmm. But I love the melody. Such a great mm -hmm. melody. And, it's, mm -hmm. and it was such a song, a timely song for the times. I just wanted to sing it, play it, and, and, and end it. Because the song spoke for itself at the time. Because that was the Vietnam period. Mm -hmm. I still see her standing by the water. But if Jimmy wrote the song about the Spanish-American War, oddly enough. I got letters from the guys on the USS Wichita, which was a supply ship, and the guys on the USS Galveston, which was a cruiser missile carrier. And they would meet in the Gulf of Tonkin for supplies, you know, to, to supply the USS Galveston. And it'd be blasting Galveston over its speaker, and the USS Wichita would be blasting Wichita linemen. He said, <laughs> He said it must have been a deterrent because they never were interrupted, you know. <laughs> he said, and then again, it's a wonder they hadn't got blown out of the water, you know. Melinda will return with her celebrity guest, the great Glenn Campbell, on Talk of the Desert in just a moment. I hear you singing in the wild. The Desert Symphony has something for everyone this season. Live entertainment supported by your professional symphony orchestra creates great memories for the entire family. Experience the finest musicians performing the classics, popular songs from theater, and even more from motion pictures. For tickets and information, go to thedesertsymphony.org or call 760-340-ARTS or 760-773-5988. It's knowing that your door is always open and your mouth is free to warm. Now, back to Melinda Reed's Talk of the Desert and her wonderful guest, Glenn Campbell. You have played literally all over the world, haven't you? Mm. Well, not yet, but not most yet, of it. But, well, g getting close. Yeah. Uh, do you have a favorite uh, place to play live? Yeah, the United States of America. <laughs> <laughs> England, England, Ireland, Scotland is very good. Uh, I, you get out of the English-speaking countries, and it's, it's a little touch and go. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, I, maybe it's because of the way I looked at it, you know. Uh, I, had a hit, I had a couple of hits in Japan. Uh, Southern Nights was a, was a big hit for me in the Orient because it's, a, it's the Oriental musical scale. Uh, it's the same way Buttons and Bows was a big hit uh, in, the, in the Orient because it's the Oriental musical scale, you know. Southern Nights, have you ever felt a Southern Night? And, and you'd go, I'd, I'd hear bands playing it, and they'd be playing it the way on, the, on those barrels and things. Da, 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 da. It's just a great melody. Why do I feel honored? Glenn Campbell is singing to me. Uh. <laughs> anyway, Glenn, I noticed also in some of your uh, biographical information that obviously you have won awards on top of awards on top of awards, but I think it was the American Music Association that you won an award for um, the same song in the pop rock uh, category and country, and country yeah. category the same year. Yeah, same year. But uh, you know, actually, it was it was a year later. Oh, was it? Well, then the uh, information uh, I have is correct. That's amazing. Yeah, it won. Okay. And it, by the time I get to Phoenix album, won the Grammy in the pop field and in the country field. That's I don't know if that's ever happened before. Uh, it, I it, I think it says that you're the only they one. They had every then all all they had then was country rock and pop and then rhythm and blues and classical and. Well, the threes were country, rock, and pop, is what it was. Mm -hmm. Elvis had the first five number one single records. 
Rhinestone Cowboy was the sixth one to ever do that, and that was 1975. Then Southern Nights was the last one to do it because they changed the charts after that. They put in easy listening and blah, 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 whatever. You mean playing the charts of what the radio stations played? Is that what you mean? Or no, the, the charts, BMI, ask, uh, the Billboard, uh, all the magazines. Right. So the listings of the number one, top right, 20 songs, one song. whatever. They got yes. so many categories today, it's incredible. <laughs> they got hip hop, bebop, you know, country rock, pop, jazz, uh, mm -hmm. you know. Well, what, do you, what do you consider yourself? Do you consider yourself to be a country singer or a pop singer? Oh, I'm a, I'm a singer. I can sing anything. It's, it's got lyrics to it, and I can, I can do it if it's, don't get higher than a high C. Uh, excuse me. A C, not high C. <laughs> With that voice. <laughs> it's just, uh, I grew, when I grew up, I had, I had to sing. All the parts were taken from the time I come along, you know. So I had to find, fit in a way, so it was usually singing high. And uh, so I could sing rangy songs, I think. There's a lot of, a lot of people that it's hard to do. Like a Rhinestone Cowboy is a rangy song. Well, most of the songs I think that you you sing that you've had hits are hummers. I mean, I hum, I've been humming Rhinestone Cowboy for the past couple mm -hmm. of days when I thought that I might get this opportunity to do this interview with you. And so all of your songs to me are sort of humming songs, but I won't hum because I even hum off key. So <laughs> <laughs> that is that is a good melody. Rhinestone Cowboy is a good melody. Yeah. Jimmy Webb wrote some of the best melodies. Uh, in fact, Wichita Lineman was the po most played song of the millennium. Uh, and I, don't, I, think it, I think they put it in the country chart, country uh, category, uh, which surprised me. And uh, that was, it also came in, I think, 49th is all, all time record. Good. They had a list of the top 100 records uh, done by producers, musicians, uh, singers, songwriters, so forth. Okay, Glenn, if somebody invited you to perform, Mm -hmm. And they said you can only sing one song, which would be a short side on their part. But what 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 song would that be? <laughs> Probably like a rhinestone cowboy. I love it. <laughs> or Amazing Grace, either one. Mm -hmm. I have my pipes. I do Amazing Grace. <laughs> really? Um, I understand that you wrote an autobiography called Rhinestone Cowboy. Yeah. Well, the guy wrote it. I told it. You know how you will uh, get the. You'll, you'll say things. He didn't say it the way I said it. You know, he, because he was from somewhere back east, uh, not that that's got anything to do with anything, but he, he just didn't tell the story like I told it, you know. I mean, he said the same thing, but he didn't say it the way I said it. Right, right. Well, it's better that you have a little control over your own autobiography because you know what happened. Right. Right? Right. And you, you know, I just said it, told it like it was and got it off my chest and went on with my life, you know. Because mm -hmm. everybody, everybody you know, I was in every brag magazine there was, you know. <laughs> Glenn Campbell was saying drunk today, or whatever. Yeah. So some of those uh, magazines are <coughs> pretty vicious. They are. Uh, um, I think the strangest headline I've ever seen was <laughs> dead, people uh, dead People Seen Alive in Heaven. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> let's talk about the, uh, the, the movie you did with John Wayne, True Grit. Oh, yeah. How did that come around? He was, his eight-year-old daughter, Melissa, was a... Uh, Fan of Glenn, it was a good time hour. She loved a good time hour. And he brought her down to meet me. It just scared me to death. You know, boy, John Wayne. I, he was my hero. I mean, number one hero. And uh, about three fourths of the movie, I had a bad cold. And I was so, when I saw the movie, I was so disappointed. <laughs> but, you know, it's one of the, the biggest, uh, it's still one of the biggest selling uh, movies of all time. I didn't, I didn't have a deal with that. I just got, and, the reason I didn't do any more acting, I could go out and make more in one night, and they wanted to pay to do a movie, you know. And I said, that didn't, the economics <laughs> didn't stack up there. You know, unless I was going to get part of the movie or part of the residual. Mm -hmm. I understand John Wayne won an Oscar for that, was that yes, right? He sure yeah, did. Did. And I got perfect. to sing a, you know, a nominated Oscar song on the, the Academy Awards, you know. How many country guys have done that? <laughs> How many have done it? How long has there been an Academy Award? There's only been a hundred and something. How many have there been, I wonder? I don't, I don't have a clue. But I just to be so blessed to get to do that, you know. And I, and I was walking over the orchestra pit, and all the guys that I had done sessions with was, yeah, Glenn, baby, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, Tommy Tedesco especially. All, you know, those, they, they were funny, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a big time, boy, you know. 
Well, Glenn, in most recent years, you've been appearing in Branson, Missouri. Mm -hmm. And you, I think you built a, built a theater there for... Uh, I, did a, I did the theater thing for a while, but that got so... Let me tell you, it was like picking cotton. But Andy Williams called me up last year, and Andy and I did... Uh, he asked me if I'd do the fall with him because his throat, he, had, he didn't say anything for 11 months. Mm -hmm. Right, but man, we did uh, seven weeks of, we did September and October in Branson this year. We're going to do it last year. We're doing it again this year, Andy and I, and it's so much fun to work with him. I mean, it's funny, it's just kick back, and, it's, and we gig each other. And it's, it's, it's one of the best shows I've been associated with. And, and then we're, next year we're going to do the spring maybe. And then maybe the fall again, he says, but then, he, you know, he's, he's kind of like me. He wants to kind of just kick back and play golf, you know. <laughs> and that's part of the reason why you're in town this exactly. week is to play in the Bob Hope Chrysler kick, Classic. I've, I've played in, I think, 29 or 30 of these. Oh, really? Yes. Hey. One at one time in 1975. Well, congratulations. Oh, I had a good team, though. <laughs> and then also recently you've been producing a lot of Christian albums. Yep, I've got uh, four Christian albums out, uh, and they're great. I love doing uh, I love doing the half and half concerts. You know, where you you you, you play a church, you play a venue where they want you to do they want you to do your contemporary stuff and then do your Christian stuff. Do do your contemporary stuff, take an intermission, and come back and do the do the, the con contemporary Christian music. It's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. I have to carry my teleprompter with me because I can't remember the words. <laughs> <laughs> how, um, how many songs have you recorded, Glenn? Oh, my word, I have no idea. Have they all been released, or are there still some back in the vault someplace? I think they've all been released. I really do. They've, they've scratched up things that I, <laughs> you know, somebody sneaked in a tape somewhere in England and did a show, I think. As the, uh, you've been hearing that Glenn lives in Phoenix, and I was wondering the reason you're living in Phoenix is because of your song. <laughs> well, when it was a hit, it was a big, huge hit in Phoenix. So I went down and I went down to Phoenix, and then I, I lo every time I went down to Phoenix to play, I played a fair a couple of times. And it was just barn burner, and so that's why I moved to Phoenix. It doesn't rain that much, and I love the desert. I love the, I just love the desert. That's why I love Palm Springs. Well, Glenn, what do you see for Glenn Campbell over the next few years? Just go out and play and sing. I love to play. I love to play guitar. God gave me a gift to play guitar and sing. And it's. By the I'll way, it's such a pleasure to be here to play for you for the Crisis Pregnancy Center, and to see all you out here supporting this makes me feel even better. By the time I get to think she'll be rising She'll find the note I left hanging on her